Good afternoon, everyone. At every inner conference, we have uh, this topic, emergency services around the world. And uh, for me, I think it's always one of the most interesting sessions because we have uh, so many participants from everywhere, even from outside Europe. And I'm very happy that we have three experts here today. We have Francisco Echeverria from the Canary Islands. We have Dr. Kriansak Pintatam from the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. And we have Mohamed Swalik from the Hong Kong Police. We will start with uh, Francisco Echeverria and he will Tell us something about essential service buildings, guaranteeing our citizens the provision of essential services. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Eugenie, for the presentation. And thank you to the organization to give us the opportunity to present uh, this project. Um, this is a, a very bad time to be here. Then thank you to all of you to be here because at least, at least in Spain is siesta time. But don't worry, don't worry. Eh? I'm going to make a very short presentation and you will not have time to, to sleep. I hope so. Hmm? My name is Francisco Echeverria, as you said, Henning, and I'm here as a technical coordinator for this project. At the end of this short pre presentation, I'm sure that you will do at least two things. One, go to visit the Canary Islands before 2025, I hope so. And second one, and most important, is to visit the Canary Islands after 2025. There are many, many reasons to visit the Canary Islands before 2025. At least the sun, the sea, the landscape, landscape, the villages, more villages, the, the food, the wine, wine, and of course the sangria. But if you visit Canary Islands after 2025, you will still have to see to, to have sun. Sí, sangría, but there will be a big difference. What is the difference? You will have the opportunity to visit this building. It's a part of a very ambitious project that we have at the moment. It's the Essential Services Building. There are two main reasons eh, to, for this project. First, the localization of, of the Canary Islands, and second, the continuous process that we have to improve the coordination of all the emergency services that we have in the island. As you know, Canary Islands is a part of Spain, but they are not here. They are not here. Already, they are there. Sorry, there, no. They are there. To put this in context, the Canary Islands are in the Atlantic Ocean, closer to Africa than to Europe, and just 1,700 kilometers from Madrid. It's just to give you an idea. The idea is that the, this is farther from here to Istanbul, or is the same distance from here to Helsinki. I have been speaking with our colleagues from uh, Finland, and they said it's a long distance. Mm? And in fact, eh, Madrid is closer to Ljubljana than to the Canary Islands. As you know, this very, very famous song that is, they said is long, long way to Tripperary, but it's longer, longer to the Canary Islands. Yes, 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 just one idea. Mm? Then, as a result of uh, the Canary Islands, 
must be completely prepared to provide the first response for every emergency. In the near future, very near future, this response will be coordinated, this is the idea, coordinated from this building. Remember, we are not speaking about one island, we are speaking about eight islands. So, in fact, we are not talking about one building on one island. We are talking about two identical buildings on two different islands. Perhaps you can see the difference. The buildings are exactly the same, but they are in different, in different places. One is in Gran Canaria and the other one is in Tenerife. Recent major emergencies uh, demonstrate that we have the capacity to provide a good service with a very high uh, qualified staff and using a very good equipment. Examples of that are the floods that we have had, forest fires, the pandemic, and of course, the volcano that we have had recently in La Palma. This is not only for the major incidents. This project is even for the everyday, everyday emergencies. We have traffic accidents, we have uh, industrial fires, or we have problems, safety problems, or uh, ambulance, we need ambulances and so on and so on. It's for all kinds of emergencies. Then, we are satisfied with the response and the present capacity that we have at the moment. So why we need two completely new buildings in the islands? Well, first, because on a group of islands, the challenges are greater than on the mainland. Second, the process of continuous improvement in the coordination of the services. Then, third, by, you, you know that, no? By integrating all the services in one building, we can optimize emergency management and coordination of all the services. The result, the result of this is a better quality of the services every day. And the, uh, for current emergencies and extraordinary emergencies. Then, if I've, I said that all the services in one building, so why are there two buildings? I always have been speaking about one building. Why we need two buildings? I explain to you. We have planned two buildings on two different islands, but they, they function as they, are, as they were one center of operations. Then, I don't know if the current description is one function in two locations or two locations with one function, because they will work at the same time, doing the same. The two buildings are identical twins, are identical twins, outside and inside. Even if one of the buildings is not operated, the other one can take care of all the functions from the other. In fact, inside, inside the building, it's impossible to know if you are in one island or in the other one, because inside the, the furniture, the distribution, everything is exactly the same. The same. This, in, this is important because in case of one emergency, we can take people from one, of the, one island to the other one to work, and they can start to work immediately, because everything is equal. Exactly, exactly equal. And then this makes this project unique in the world. Let's see that in, in more detail. The buildings house, house only, only the control rooms for all the emergency services. The, the personnel and the equipment, they are not in the buildings. The idea is only to coordinate the actions for all the emergency services. 
and then the building will provide communications and coordination for all the eight islands. Let's look at the present situation just to, to, to understand the plan for the future. Hmm? At the moment, the control room of all the different emergency services, social services and information services are in different localizations. You can see this is a map, and then all the services are in different, in different buildings and different offices and so on and so on. As, as a result of that, this project will, will concentrate in all the uh, control rooms in the same place, in the same building. As you can see, uh, uh, you can see, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Then, the, in the middle will be the 112, of course, but all the services, all the control services from the other eh, will be around, around the 112. And all of them, they will be inside the same building. This is the idea that we have. Then, the, the, the key idea behind this project is to optimize the coordination of all the emergency services. Why the concentration is clear, no? An optimal uh, level of coordination is difficult to achieve when multiple services are in different uh, localizations. It's necessary a lot of time eh, if you need to, to move the people from one place to other one to have a, a crisis uh, a meeting. Mm? When all the services are inside the same roof, that is very, very easy and very fast to, to do. Mm? I'd like to mention three important characteristics of uh, the buildings. First, there are, as I said, two identical buildings, twins, exactly twins. Mm? In case of one of the buildings is not operated, the other one can replace it immediately. Mm? However, the design of the buildings eh, uh, reduce this risk, this risk. The specification said that means that they can resist a strong winds, earthquakes, flood, and even, even lava from volcanoes. Second, because all the services are in the same building, under the same roof, they can share uh, central services, like uh, the cafeteria, restaurant, uh, press room, changing rooms, emergency generators, computer, uh, computer uh, services, and so on. And third, everything is ready for what is needed now, hmm? but in the future. Why? Because the total area of the, each building is going to be around 23,000 square meters. Hmm? And this gives us the capacity for all the current services that we have now and in the future, because the expansion is for over uh, 500 people. If everything hmm, is according to the plan, I hope so, we hope so, eh, they will be operated in 2025. Hmm? Then let's go to visit the, 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 the buildings. Hmm? This, this, uh, the buildings are going to be like that. They're very nice and so on and so on. But this is, for instance, just to support the strong, strong winds that they, uh, we have there. Eh? Because the wind, uh, is, uh, the direction is changing by eh, the size of the building. Mm. It's, it's nice outside, inside, outside, and the cafeteria and so on, the press rooms and so on. No? And this. This, for instance, is going to be the room for the 112, the main, main uh, room uh, for the emergency. The operators, they will be here working, and here on top will be the crisis uh, room, but no inside. Eh? Because when uh, you know that, when there is a, a crisis, even there are traffic accidents, there are heart attacks, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then the operators must still work in the day to day. But here, there will be uh, operators working here with the politicians, and so on, and so on. Eh? But the crisis room will be a part of the uh, 112 room 
here there will be the offices and so on and so on. Mm? More, more nice pictures. Mm? And uh, essential services buildings in Spanish eh, we call edificios de servicios esenciales. Eco, sierra, eco. And we pronounce that S, S. Remind that, eh? S. Mm? Okay. Then, all the information about uh, the Canary Assistant Services, you can find it on the, on the web site. Where is the web? Here. Eh? You can find the, all the uh, because it's going to be adapted every day just with the evolution of the, of the building. Mm? Then, you can contact me, as I said before, in this uh, email address and telephone number. And now, eh, you have another reason to visit the Canary Islands in 2025. Mm? Come to visit us before 2025 and after 2025. You are invi invited. Eh? And remember, eh, in the Canary Islands, in addition of sun, S, sea, and sangria, there is safety, security, and of course, time for siesta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Do we have any questions? Then raise your hand. Oh, yo, yo. Oh, yo, yo. Say, say, say. I can see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the light is there. <laughs> Let me know. If any, any? If there are any free places available, it was more of a joke, so it's yeah. for any job applications. <laughs> you, you made an adv uh, advertise, so. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we start with a project, yes, um, four years ago, and now uh, the situation is that, um, I don't know if you want to know that, but I want to tell you that uh, uh, in 30 days from now, from today, we will know who is going to build the buildings. Mm? And then the calendar that we have is that 2025 will be ready. Perhaps will be a little bit later, but the offer that we made to Ina, Paris, Jerome, is that perhaps, if you want, once we can have the meeting there. And then you will visit at least Canary Islands after 2025. But if you want to go before, you're invited. Hmm? OK. Any more questions? Oh, my god. <laughs> it's not uh, clear. <laughs> uh, why two buildings? Why not three? Why not another one in yeah, Porto Ventura? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to have, we, we are thinking to build three. But if you give us 40 million euros for one building, we will, build, we will have three. The price of each building, of everything inside, of course, is 40 million of euros for each building then we think that with two will be enough. No? But one will be cheaper. Ah, why so? Well, yeah, because in case that we have, that we have had floods, we want to be sure that every day, every moment, every hour, we can give the answer to the citizens in case that they need uh, help. Two? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course, for that. Yeah, 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 of course. We know it's expensive, but uh, one more thing. You know, the population of the Canary Islands is 2.2 million of inhabitants. Hmm? Before the COVID, you know how many people they visit the Canary Islands? 16 million of people. 16, hmm? 16 million people. Then we need to have a strong um, uh, power, eh? in case of uh, emergency uh, occurs. This is why we are thinking to have two identical buildings. Uh, identical buildings. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Francisco. Thanks a lot.
Now we hear Dr. Kriangsak Pintatam from the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. King Sak. Thank you for Ina to, for inviting me to be here to the, uh, present my presentations about the emergency call handling in Thailand and the future planning in Thailand. I work in uh, the Ministry of Public Health and also in Chiang Rai Pashanukor Hospital that located in the top north of Thailand. And I work in the medical dispatch center for emergency call for emergency medical call in Thailand. Today, I will focus on three topics. First, I will introduce you about the background of Thailand. The second one is the present emergency call in Thailand. And the third one is the future plan for emergency calls in Thailand. For the Thailand is located in the Southeast Asia. Uh, this is Thailand. Uh, it looks like the eggs. Uh, and they are about uh, the spanning of the area is about 500 and 13 million kilometers square and about 69.8 million people in in Thailand but Thailand is a travel uh, the uh, many many tourists to go into Thailand to travel in Thailand about 70 million per year uh, Thailand's composed of four regions uh, 76 provinces and one capital city the capital city is Bangkok and for the northern part of Thailand, we are we have uh, eight provinces, thirty-four provinces in the central part of Thailand, and twenty-one provinces in the northern east of Thailand, and fourteen provinces in the southern part of Thailand. Each province has their own dispatch centers in in each province. For the emergency calls in Thailand, this is the uh, uh, when. The people or the citizens encounter with emergency conditions or e emergency problems, they can call directly to the organizations or, or authorities that take in charge of each event, such as when you encounter with the medical conditions, you have the emergency uh, medical problems, you can call directly to the hospital or you can call to the emergency dispatch centers in, in the hospital and they will send you about the ambulance to take care of the patients. That is the reason that Thailand have many, many emergency call number in Thailand, such as when you uh, encounter with the problem with securities, you can uh, call 191 for the police. When you have uh, some problem in the highway, you can call 1193 for the highway patrol. If you have uh, some medical problems, you want to go to the hospital, but you live in Bangkok, you choose call 1646. But in the worldwide across, uh, in, in all, the, all of the area across the country, you will call 1669. When you have a fire, you will call 199. That I cannot remember it at all because it's a lot of uh, several number for the emergency call in Thailand. This is a dispatch center for the fire department. When you call to 199, they will go to the dispatch center that located in 77 provinces across the country. And they will send team to the affected area. This is the call center of the loyal Thai police that located in Bangkok, in the capital city of Thailand. This is the core, number of core of the medical emergency call. There are about 1.8 million calls per year. And uh, the call is slightly dropped in 2020s uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, the majority of calling in Thailand is the accident. Uh, in, in the COVID-19 pandemic situation, the accident has been decreased. And this is the for 2024, uh, 22, so about 1.6 million for 10 months. Uh, this is the dispatch center that's located in my hospital in Chiang Rai, in the north of Thailand. This is for the emergency medical calls. 
we uh, have uh, the ambulance operation center that can tracking the ambulance when the dispatch center send the ambulance to the patients, they can tracking the ambulance. And we have some uh, information for the team in the ambulance go, uh, that sent back to the dispatch center to consult the doctor or emergency physicians to give some medical directions to them and take care of the patients and uh, take care of the patients during transfer to the hospital. This is also the same uh, dispatch center, but this is Rama Tipadi Hospital in Bangkok. This is the dispatch center for medical dispatch centers. We also integrated the CCTV system to monitoring uh, about the public safety. This is uh, in the Pattaya City Hall. As you know, the Pattaya is the famous for the tourism. There are lots of foreign to travel in Pattaya City. They need to concern about the public safety. They integrate the CCTV around the Pattaya cities and to monitor about uh, the disaster, about the mass casualty incidents or some emergency incidents, and can, they can detect and send team to, to manage the crisis management in quickly. For the future plan for the emergency call handling in Thailand, uh, we try to consolidate emergency number into a single number that I told you earlier. Uh, Thailand has a several number of emergency calls, and we try to use geographic information or GIS technologies to respond to the emergency conditions. This diagram shows you that uh, we try to consolidate all of the emergency call number into the single one number, like in Europe, in 112, or or in other countries, uh, we have the nationwide system for the, da the data, uh, the big data uh, library, and we have the regional system for the 11 regions command center to, uh, uh, to monitor the quality control of the emergency calls. And we have 77 PSAPs for the each province to have their own uh, dispatch center that integrate uh, 191, 1669199 into the single number. Uh, some applications was developed and used to uh, in the dispatch centers. This is the for example, this is the A Life uh, applications that can collect about the uh, medical data of the patients and can connect with the uh, some equipment such as wristband or Apple Watch or some uh, medical equipment. And when they have some medical problems, they can send up all the data into the dispatch centers and dispatch center can send uh, transfer the data to the doctors and give some medical directions to the uh, emergency teams who work in the ambulance such as paramedic or other medical personnel to take care of the patient and transfer to uh, transfer patients to the hospital. This is the GPS locator of the caller. Uh, this is the e-ambulance applications that can locate the locations of the ambulance and the locations of the patients that make uh, the ambulance to find the patient easier and quickly. For the public warning, we have the uh, application that developed by the Department of Disaster Prevention and Mitigations, we call Thai Disaster Alert. Uh, these applications uh, can alert about the type of the disaster that will occur in the soon and the level of alert, the area that involved to the, the disaster, and and they can give some informations about uh, about how to prepare how to prepare to the disaster that will occur soon. Uh, after 2004, Thailand was hit by the tsunami in the southern part of Thailand. And we developed uh, the early warning system for the tsunami in the 
the southern part of Thailand. This is the tsunami detector that located in the sea. And when the tsunami is forming, the detectors send the signals to the receptor that located in the shores or in the coast and its alarm and send directly to the people who stay around the area at risk by the SFS. This is the uh, applications for emergency medical uh, developed by the National Institute for Emergency Medicine or NIMS. Uh, we call D1669 for the patients to call to the dispatch centers for the emergency problems and they can uh, locate the locations of AED in the applications. For the AED locator, Thai Red Cross Society was mapping about the AED and integrate into the applications. And when you have patients cardiac arrest, you can find the nearest AED via the applications and you can call uh, press this button to call 1669 to the emergency ambulance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kirangsak. Are there any questions? It sounds like your strategy revolves around applications, and it looks like there are multiple applications. So yes. my questions, my question is twofold. Number one, why not put everything in one application? And number two, uh, there's been lots of research that shows that people don't download applications. Uh, even your neighbor in Malaysia created an application for the hearing impaired and one for the blind for 999 and uh, they saw very few downloads. So what are you gonna do to address that and to motivate people to download? That is a good idea. <laughs> and, and we have discussed in, in our countries about you are, you're concerning about the, the pre-download applications before uh, when they encounter to the emergency conditions, they cannot download anywhere and they can use anything. That is a, this is a very important point that we concern. But, but uh, we have the other channels to, to make the people or the citizens to have uh, many, many channels to, to call the emergency uh, agency for, the, for uh, help them. But uh, uh, the first recommendations of you, I think this is the recommendations to integrate all of the applications into the one application. Yes, we, we try to integrate our application that we use the D1669 that developed by a National Institute for Emergency Medicine to integrate our application. We, we try to integrate it now. And, and in the near future, we will see that the one application and one number also. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any more questions? Yeah. Tom? Hi. Um, <clears throat> I have a question that uh, I think goes a bit together with the, the question of Fiona. Um, I would like to understand a bit better um, how you want to, um, to basically um, lead this reform of having a single emergency number. So if I understand correctly, you want to um, deploy kind of stage one PSAPs at regional level that will then forward the calls to different agencies at uh, a more local level. Is it correct? Yes. Um, so, does it, so it means that you're going to have a single number. Um, so it means that basically all these apps that you have, um, you, you will be able to basically have a single app uh, going to the level one uh, PSAPs, right? Yeah. And then level one PSAPs will be able to forward data to level two PSAPs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe another question, sorry. Uh, do you consider implementing AML? Because here again, uh, you, you spoke about uh, apps. Yeah. Um, are you in the process to, um, to implement advanced mobile location? Yes, yes. Yes, we are going to implement uh, because in Thailand it's, it's very hard to, to locate the locations of the, the patients or the, the people who can call for the emergency agency. 
that that the mobile location is very important for Thailand and and some area has uh, developed and implement already but but it's not at the whole country but the future will we integrate this applications to the whole countries that can help thank you very much now we have Mohamed Zwalik from the Hong Kong police thank you. Uh, before delving into uh, the smart rescue solutions and emergency call handling in Hong Kong Let's um, talk about Hong Kong first. Uh, <clears throat> Hong Kong has some of the most amazing geography. Um, well, you name it, mountains, you know, viewpoints, beaches and things. And for rescuers, these are the most challenging um, scenarios for conducting rescues. Um, some fun facts about Hong Kong. Hong Kong is called the Pearl of the Orient because it is a melting pot of the East and the West. You know, it is a world's important financial hub some of the busiest trading, you know, ports, container ports, airports. Um, we have the longest sea crossing beach, bridge, the longest covered escalators. You know, we have some of the highest number per capita of restaurants and cafes anywhere in the world. Um, we have the Asia's first, the oldest, steepest vernacular railway to the peak. Um, we have the biggest sitting Buddha one of the biggest sitting Buddha in the world. Um, Hong Kong is also the cradle for Kung Fu legends, you know. Um, but I think it, for Hong Kong, what is best known about Hong Kong is about our skyscrapers. We have 8,000s of them and making Hong Kong one of the most densely populated, you know, places on earth. Now, here's a twist. What many people doesn't know about Hong Kong is 40% of Hong Kong are, is designated as country parks, protected areas. Um, so, so this is a part of Hong Kong that I will talk about more about in terms of mountain rescue. Um, so now we will come back to the emergency call handling in Hong Kong. Now there are like 7.5 to 7.6 million people in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's size is very small. It's just about 1,100 square kilometers. And and we, we use a single number. Uh, in Hong Kong, it is 999. Everybody knows the number. 112 also works in Hong Kong. And for SMS, it is not 999, it is 992. But at the moment, it is pre-registered. There are, we have basically three main centers uh, on Hong Kong Island. So the PSAP in Hong Kong Island, Kowloon Peninsula, and the New Territory. So, so the three of them handles in a year over 2 million calls. So it's a very busy. So daily, on average, is 5,700 calls, a lot of calls. Um, and the model that we are using, um, it's basically the patient calls when there is an SOS, and the um, call takers takes the call in one of those three uh, PSAPs. Then if it is police related, it is then passed on to the police um, dispatch. Uh, if it is ambulance or fire, it is from that point, the 999 center, pass it to the fire and ambulance, and so on and so forth, police vehicles, you know, ambulance, you know, fire is then passed on. Now, the, most cha the more challenging part about this is what we have found, um, we are talking about the next generation type of smart rescue solutions that we wish to share with you. Now, what happened in the past few years since the pandemic, what we have noticed in Hong Kong, our experience is that maybe people couldn't fly. Um, then they suddenly discover about the Hong Kong's mountains and beaches and coastline and everything. So people actually go into these places without realizing that some of these places, you know, are quite dangerous. And the weather in Hong Kong, as you may know, it can be very hot in summer. It can be very cold in winter. There are cliffs, there are dangerous places. So in short, our accident rates have climbed, like have increased by 370%. It is a very alarming figure. Now in terms of serious, in terms of death, you know, every month there are two to three people, you know, dying in the outdoor because of adventure. Uh, so that is a very alarming number. There is a short introduction that I would like to introduce to you about Hong Kong.
Uh, we have got all kinds of very challenging cases from you know lone hikers, you know campers. People go out to outer races. They go into the mountains for trainings. We have got people with dementias, old people. Um, sometimes you know we have to dispatch like hundreds of officers into the mountain across disciplines, or from fire departments, you know, ambulance, you know, police, marine police, and it is extremely challenging for us. Um, now, the technology we use in the past, it's basically, basically just cell tower. You know, they call, we try to triangulate, we try to find out. And as you may all know, it is not a real good solution. Uh, the two cases that I want to share with you is one, it's a very famous paraglider case. It's a very sad case. They flew out, bad weather, typhoon came in, um, and they were dispersed, you know, lost. From the cell tower, the location that we got, was actually seven kilometers away from the actual site. And imagine, you know, like we, we search for days and days, it's not gonna help. Now the second case, we call it the last year, the, the, it's a new year hiking incident. You know, the, our father went with a son, a young kid, they went into the mountain, it's the wife that called that they didn't went home. All right, from the last call locations, you know, you triangulate, it was, again, it was like kilometers away. And you know, all the, um, uh, rescue teams went to the wrong place for searching. Uh, imagine how challenging that is. And that is why Hong Kong was one of the first, well, we are the first Asian cities around that area to implement AML. We have been working since 2018, um, but the problem, the challenge for us, it's that uh, we, at the moment, we only have iOS devices enabled with AML. And we are very happy to be in INA because during discussions, um, Google understands our challenges and they have promised to work with us uh, in the coming months. But what we find in our experience is that it is very accurate. We have done enormous amount of tests in the forest, in the canopies, you know, deep into the trails, and we make calls to the, uh, you know, PSAPs. And, and for us, it's, it's a really game-changing technology, I would say. So all the mobile operators in Hong Kong, they are, they are ready for it. Our servers are all ready. It's just that because the uh, iOS and Android are the single largest, you know, the, almost it covers everything in Hong Kong. Um, but more importantly, um, I would... There you go. Um, what we found out is that AML alone um, is not enough. Uh, due to the challenges that I, I mentioned, accuracy problem that pe previously people talk about. Uh, but, but in our cases, our experience that I want to share with you is a lot of these patients, they are either, you know, too weak, too dehydrated, they, they faint, they couldn't press, you know, the SOS, you know. So who, who and a lot of these cases, it's the, uh, uh, you know, the emergency contacts, you know, the family members who calls us and tell us that they didn't come home. What can we do? And the other great challenge about rescue missions is that there are a lot of places, if you look at the terrain in Hong Kong, there are a lot of places out in the sea, you know, the coastline, the mountains, you know, the canyons, you know, the cliffs, there are no signal, not even 2G and 3Gs. So the Hong Kong police, uh, we have developed some new, new next generation smart rescue solutions which, is, which to us are game changers. And that is why we would like to share with you all. Now, the first one, if you see next to the AML, is the, what we call the HKSOS. Now, you can, you can treat it as a 999X SOS or 112 SOS. It's the same thing. It is an application. Now, Fiona just now mentioned that if you ask people to download something, the biggest challenge is, are they gonna download? And now, what is different from this application is that it directly connects um, to the PSAP. It doesn't go to intermediaries. So it is a, it's, it's, it's a very, very different uh, application, uh, if, uh, if, if I have more time to explain. But the other th important thing about this application is every time someone downloads it and creates an event, it is an event-based application, it will assign a unique number to the mobile phone. All right, the, the reason why, why it does that, uh, I'll explain a little bit later when I talk about signal radar and the res rescue AI. Now we also, other than the application, what we realize is that um, traditional work of the rescue teams are quite um, challenging. They have to run around command posts, they have to draw on maps, you know, they, it's, it's difficult to 
you know, all the time just communicate on radio and no situational uh, on the mountains and, and the seas. So we created this 3R. All it stands for is a three rescue solution. For the first time, we unified the map for all rescue teams. So everybody just look at the same map. It is an electronic map. And the other thing is that we use smart watches um, with high accuracy GPS sending back all the time to the command post. So they do not have to report their locations. All the teams, everything will be you know, plotted on the map itself. Where they have sweep, where they have yet to find, you can draw on the maps which, route, which team will be going. So everything is on a single map, single platform. You can, you can view it at your headquarters, you can view it at your forward command post. It's impressive. Now, the third the R is the R camera. Uh, we use different technologies to combine it so that the scene of accidents, you know, whether it's a waterfall, landslide, anything, um, you can send images back to the back end to the command post. Now, that has massively changed how we organize, and we believe that it, it has massively increased the efficiency of the rescue and coordination. And more importantly, uh, as we found out in many cases, um, the safety um, uh, the safety of the, of the um, first responders are very important. We have got many cases, it's the first responders that, that gets serious injuries. You know? and, and that's the, um, our, our watch, it, it sends all the biometric data back, you know, like whether he's fallen down, the heart rate and everything, so that the command post knows and they can call them if you are all right, you know, you should slow down, those kind of things. Now, I'll move on. I was talking about HK SOS, and then, and then I'll talk about 3R. Then the next one is a signal radar. Now, signal radar is a very unique thing that we have just worked with one of the companies that have got patented technology. Now, what it does is the, the, the challenge that I mentioned earlier. There are many places that has got no signal. So what signal radar does, right? It works on drones. It works on, you know, helicopters. Uh, officers can wear them and carry to the spots. What it does, it, it gives signals. And what it does, it, it search for people. The, the, the unique number I was talking about in HKSOS, in places where there are no signals at all. Okay, so anyone who has downloaded an event, right, they've pressed it. And there, somebody then, whether it's themselves or their, you know, the emergency contact, press the SOS button, you know, then signal radar will work, kicks in, and it will find whenever somewhere around, it's a long range, so you're talking about kilometers. Last week, we were doing a flight test from the helicopter. It was 2,000 feet above, and we were able to find, even on the sea, even on can, uh, forested canopy, we were able to search our, our subjects. So it, it's a game changer for us. And the last one I would like to share with you is the HKSOS will collect data on the event. All right, what it collects, it's like the large locations, you know, this, the, all, the, all the sensor meters on the mobile phone, how fast has been going, you know, we'll combine it with the weather information, you know, how hot we, it was, the terrain information, the vegetation and everything, and the past accident records. And we put it all, the rescue AI is a deep learning AI model. It combines all these information and it automatically calculates, you know, on the map, on the our map and show it to the first responder. This is the area that you're going to highest probability of you finding the subject. And it changes with time. This is a primary area, secondary area, and it does it so that the command centers do not have to spend extra manpower and experience just to plotting on the maps. So we believe in Hong Kong is that all these solutions together with the, such a good AML um, that Ina has, you know, you know, um, brought it to many countries. I think it's a life-changing, you know, revolutionize how rescue is being conducted. Um, now, the, what we are talking is not just a concept. What we are talking has been heavily tested, and we are about to roll out all these solutions in Hong Kong. Uh, this is from our recent testing.
Um, in, in, in rescue, we believe that, you know, in search, every search and rescue mission, we believe every second and every small effort counts. I think with better utilization of technology, um, we, we can actually um, protect our citizens better and, you know, conduct a better mission in saving lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, Michael from IT and Development Center in Estonia, Ministry of the Interior. I was wondering about the uh, watches you said and the uh, devices that you use on your rescue workers. Do you have any specific models, etc., that you can recommend to look into or or what your experiences with those metrics and and how accurate they are and how reliable they are also in changing uh, conditions i mean indoors high temperatures low temperatures maybe as well well for your case of course mostly high temperatures thank you very much for this very good questions i think it's very relevant now the the r watch that we have made right it's it's really very new um within a year uh, we did it with one of the uh, leading companies uh, a lot of r and d it's not the commercial watches that which is available uh, because inside there is a specific program that we have we have calibrated it for mountain search and rescue um, so so every basically every 1 to 3 seconds it sends back the GPS location, all the raw data. And of course, then it calculates the routes and everything. So it is not like a commercial running watch that at the end of your activity, you press a button and it looks very nice on the program. Um, our watch is designed for you know, life sa the, the safety of the officers. So that's why um, every, every few seconds we collect it back. And we need to know, like sometimes, you know, it's not just for, for, for the mountains. You know, we use it in the marine as well. So high speed, you know, marine boats, you know, uh, officers wear it. So we need high accuracy. So that was how we designed the whole program. The watch has to be very reliable. It has to be very accurate. It has to send back the, um, the, the, the uh, biometric data, like the heartbeat and everything, the body temperature. And also, we are, we are now at the, at the moment, we are, we are, what we're working on is the crash detection things. So if officers roll down, right, it will send alerts to the back-end command center. So our watch, at the moment, like signal radar and our watch is only available in Hong Kong. Uh, um, because this has just been rolled out and we are trying to refine it. Um, but the reason we are coming here to share is whether it's in, in your countries, you know, uh, I think all these good technologies can be used across, you know, um, you know, all rescue teams anywhere in the world. And that is the reason why we would like to share with you all. Any more questions? Mohammed, I'll ask the same question I asked you at your booth because I think it's uh, the audience should hear this. So you're collecting a lot of um, high accuracy location information, health information of your first responders of the, the person who calls for help. Uh, this could be considered personally identifiable information. How is it stored? How is it secured? Um, and uh, what, you know, as, as somebody who might be concerned about privacy, like how do you address those concerns? Yeah. Uh, that's a Fiona's question. It's a very good question. Um, we have uh, considered that in length. Um, that is why our, our server that collects the data, it's purely for rescue missions. It's not for anything else. And the data that we collect, if someone puts in an event, right, we do not monitor that phone number for a long time. It's just during the period of the event. Let's say you say, I'm going to a mountain in Slovenia from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock on this date. And when the event finishes, the person can, can just say it's the end of the event, so he's safe, right? And the server only keeps that data for 48 hours. Now, we have all got a very similar applications in Hong Kong that keeps it for seven days, all right? But uh, for us, we just keep it for 48 hours, and then everything is erased. We do not keep like names and everything. You know, we, we do not. We just need the phone number, the event, the emergency name or the emergency phone number so that they can press the SOS. And we have done a lot of security impact analysis, uh, uh, the privacy impact analysis so from a third party. So the whole purpose is for 
when, when there is a case, you know, so the responders will be able to know in the first place where exactly this, the, the information that they need, just like what you mentioned, it's like the latitude, longitude, the timestamps and those kind of things. Um, of course, the rescue AI has other information, you know, like, like during the event, you know, how, what, what, what was the rate, you know, how fast that person was moving. But all these is because we use AI to predict, you know, to help the responders to know where they should be looking for the patient. You know, so we do not keep any unnecessary information, and, and after those that period of time, it, it will be erased from the server. What happens if the person forgets to hit end event? Uh, like after he gets up, yeah, that, that there is. This is a very very good question uh, that Fiona raised. What if that person, you know, he's not, you know, he's he's just not answering. So the HKSOS, what it does, it it would divert the attention to the uh, the. the um, the, 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 the relatives or whoever he has put the name as, on the, as the emergency contact. So, so the HESO will alert that person is, is so and so like Calvin, is, is he safe and those kind of things. So, so if that person confirms that he's safe, right, it's the end of the event. So we are just event based. So, that, so we, don't, we don't do anything. But if the emergency contacts then press the SOS, it then goes directly to the 999, you know, uh, center. That data will be then taken down, and you can see where its last location. And I think that's the beauty of the HK SOS. It it, it gives the uh, you know the the PSAPs operators, you know, like the first, the very informed decision. This person is now in the mountain, you know, you know maybe he's in need of help. He's not answering, you know. So we need to deploy rescuers, you know, responders to look for him instead of beginning the investigation. You know, we have got a lot of experience uh, in this. That if you have no such information, you're just circling and circling and trying to figure out what's happening. Eventually, maybe that person is just got his battery die out and he's not responding. You know. So. Okay, we are running out of time, but we have uh, one more question. I hope a short one. Uh, yes, it's short. Um, right now, it's probably voluntary to put on this application, right? Yes, yeah. it's, it is all voluntary. Uh, have you, have you, were you thinking about um, for high risk areas, national parks, I don't know, whatever you have in your uh, uh, place, uh, for putting it mandatory if you want to enter the park or whatever trail or something to put it on and so it's because it's a high risk area for uh, incidents and stuff like Thank that. Thank you for your very, very insightful um, recommendation. Um, at the moment, we are trying to put the HK SOS. Uh, it hasn't been formally rolled out. It will be rolled out at the end of this year before. Um, all the country parks, the maps, will have the QR codes for it. Um, some of the high risk events like the ultra marathons and things. So we are working, we, we will try and work with the organizers. Um, because those are really high risk, as you said. Um, so it could be the event organizers' requirement that they need to download because it saves a lot of time if something happens uh, because you do not put uh, the responders at risk as well because people will be going and looking for you, don't know where you are. So, so we are trying to use these. And, and the other thing about HKSOS is we try to make it not just for just one purpose, which is... Um, when you have an SOS scenario. We try to put it as like a hiking planner. There are a lot of good stuff in it, which it will alert you if your area will have lightning in the coming few hours, you know, which, which is very, very important because out in the um, uh, and adventurous activities, um, we have cases where people hit by lightning and everything. So I think we're trying to make it um, uh, very beneficial in that sense um, so that people will actually use it. Thank you. Can I yeah, sure, sure, please. What just uh, okay. uh, just uh, this app uh, um, is the app uh, continuously uh, sending the location, or uh, just in the case of pressing SOS button. And uh, <laughs> uh, what if someone uh, press SOS button um, accidentally? Accidentally. Yes. accidentally. Yeah. Um, of course, when when someone press the SOS, we have a double confirmation if it is an you know, that's enough. But the question, going back to the thing, yes, when the event starts, right? As I said, in Slovenia, I'm going to a mountain, you know, Calvin just, you know, put an event. So from the moment you put on the event, the, the app will actually collect the GPS location, you know? So it's not just the moment, because sometimes when you enter an area, there is no signal, 
and then you press the SOS, it doesn't really help. You know, so we need all the other information, you know, the event, you know, how fast, where it will go. That will help the deep learning AI model to predict actually where is the highest chance. Because in saving lives, as you know, right, really, if you reach one minute earlier, one second earlier, it's a matter of life and death. And that is the reason why we call, we do not just take these person, you know, these sensitive things, you know, because we do it for a person purpose, and that is to save life. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for. I think we heard three very interesting presentations. Before I let you go, two infos from me. Now we have coffee break for uh, the next 20 minutes in both floors. And after that, the show will go on with providing more data to first responders in the Gullis Hall. In the Linnert Hall, we, hear, we will hear successes of PSAP communications. In the STE Hall, we will hear something about a guidance to industry and member states on the scope of the delegated regulation of the EU. And here in the Kosovo Hall, we have part two of emergency communications handling around the world. Thank you. <laughs>